Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversants are Jamie Reed and channel favorite Eliza Mondegreen. Yeah, Eliza probably doesn't need any introduction, but she's been writing on the issue of gender, specifically the phenomena of social contagion on the internet. And Jamie Reed was a healthcare provider at Washington University's Youth Gender Clinic in St. Louis, Missouri. And earlier this year, Jamie published some documents and proof that the care that was being provided for the children was not up to snuff and has since then been active in shedding more light on the problems within the so-called gender affirmative medical profession. And in this conversation, us three talk about Jamie's experience and the, let's just say, failures of the medical community to actually provide decent, well-rounded, evidence-based care for gender-distressed youth. Jamie's awesome. So is Eliza. Links to their work are down there in the description. Without further ado, here is Jamie Reed and Eliza Mondegreen. I was at the American Academy of Pediatrics conference in, good Lord, where was I this time? Washington, D.C. And yes, I met um, a number of detransitioners for the first time in person, and it was quite an emotional (laughs) roller coaster of an experience. And you just got back yesterday, right? Yeah. Okay. Why why did people converge on the American Academy of Pediatrics? So I think one of the issues was that I think everyone might have been there for a little bit of a different reason, which was okay. But we were all staffing um, a table that was um, put on by FAIR in medicine. And the American Academy of Pediatrics is in my in my view, one of the three legs to the three-legged stool that are holding up the house of cards. Mm -hmm. So they released uh, kind of, kind of sort of guidelines. It was kind of funky. We, We spoke about that. And I watched some footage of the guy who wrote those guidelines for gender medicine on an interview. And he's kind of a shifty character, but, um, why are they one of these three pillars? So in my assessment, most of the centers in the United States that are operating are operating under the American Academy of Pediatrics policy statement, the WPATH guidelines, and the American Endocrine Society guidelines. I know that a lot of people will say there's 80 million people that support this. It really is just those three that make the kind of the decisions and lead the clinicians to their practices. And what state, uh, so I guess in order to reform gender medicine, which is kind of a euphemism, uh, one of the main vectors of reform would be to confront or to challenge or to at least try to initiate dialogue with the American Academy of Pediatrics? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the reasons why we were there was actually to thank the AAP for um, making the public statement that they are going to commission and complete a systematic review of evidence. They did reaffirm the 2018 Jason Rafferty policy statement but they did that with the caveat that they're going to complete the systematic review. So that was part of what we were doing. We're there to say, thank you, AP. We're so glad you're going to do your systematic review of evidence. Um, And we also kind of my elevator pitch to people coming up to the table was we are here with Farron Medicine. They are an organization that is really in support of free speech and the concept that there are difficult questions in medicine that deserve difficult Mm -hmm. adult conversations and calm conversations that are divorced from politics and divorced from partisan yelling basically at one another. Mm -hmm. Were you yelled at? (laughs) Yes. Yes, we were yelled at. Um, I think... I think we 
we entered with the expectation that we would not be there long. So I think we, okay. I think a number of us thought that we were going to be removed from the exhibitors hall pretty quickly. Um, in part, just knowing historically, Sagam had attempted to actually purchase a table in the exhibitors hall in the past. They were canceled once it was found out who they were. Um, so I think there was this kind of group thought hey we're going to try we're going to show up and if we get removed we get removed but we're going to we're going to give it a try and we were not removed at all um there was definitely a number of providers who once they figured out what we were talking about made the statement you should not be here um mm -hmm. and a number then were taking pictures of us as if they were going to go complain somewhere but okay. um, we we were not removed we actually gave away so many books. The Pitt's book, the parents' book was there. Um, Hannah Barnes' book, A Time to Think, was there. And Stella, Sasha, and Lisa's book, um, When Your Child Says They're Trans, was there. We gave them all out. We we had boxes and boxes of books. We had tons of material. Everything was taken. Hmm. And we made it through. Hmm. Was there... Uh, do you have the perspective to answer the question if things if you notice that there is a change over from previous or over over time if people are a little bit more um open to the information and or the people who are shutting down this information don't have as much clout as they had before there was so much mixed reaction. There were so many clinicians who, once they realized who we were and what we were wanting to talk about, I think a lot of people saw kind of three different changes. Some were mad and had one reaction. Some were very curious and really were engaged and spoke about the sense that, oh, yeah, this is really a big issue. We really do need to be talking about it. And then there was this third group, and you just saw them relax. Oh, I can actually talk to you all. Yeah. And, and there was a number of them, once they relaxed, that also kind of looked around at our faces, and they started saying things like, oh, that's Chloe Cole. Wait, I, like, they put, they started putting two and two together, and they were starting, and, and, there was a number of people who actually broke down in tears once they realized who we were like good relief tears um coming behind the table and sitting with chloe and Prisha and laura and and all of the detransitioners and you know there was a lot of group hugs and a lot of emotional situations that uh, people were very grateful of our presence. Mm -hmm. And then there were some that were very disturbed. Huh. Eliza, now I'm going to pose I, a question. Yeah, I was oh, going to pose a question okay. to Eliza. Do you have any guess on who, who made up the very disturbed? Um, like some specific names or some general types? No, just general types. I mean, I think that there are a lot of people trying to manage cognitive dissonance around this issue while continuing to transition kids and that they probably wouldn't be thrilled to see you. There are providers who are working in gender centers. Yeah. That were there. And then there were a number of providers who are parents of trans kids. Yeah, that too. And they have the most difficult position yeah Helen so, Joyce is really good about this when she's like those parents have to be all in otherwise they yeah. have to say that they did something really terrible to their kids when they wanted to protect them so there are providers who transition their own children correct there are pediatricians and doctors who have children who there were a number of them. There was um, there was a couple who stated that they have probably an early 20s trans masculine. They said they had a son. There was a provider who 
said that they have maybe a 13 or 14 year old non-binary child. Um, and then there was actually a very challenging situation. So one of the detransitioners that was there is a young man named Abel, who was in California and now living in Texas. He is a native Spanish speaker. And he was actually engaging with the huge number of providers that are from Latin America, Mexico, Peru, Colombia. There was a lot of providers from Latin America. So he was engaging with them directly in Spanish. And there was a physician, I believe, from Colombia who came up and was with a young person who was male presenting. So was in mm -hmm. boy clothes, maybe had shoulder length, kind of curly hair. Dad and Abel started talking and were very engaged. And the child immediately went into a huge reaction because the child is identifying as female and is, I believe, medically transitioning. And the dad had not been in support of that decision. Okay. And the dad said to the child, I am going to listen to Abel and I'm going to stay here. And Abel was simply trying to tell his own story of his transition and then detransition and the medical harms that he experienced and, you know, surgical care that he's had to gone through, had to go through. And it was, um, I think we were the, you know, people don't come into an exhibitor's hall in a medical, <laughs> they come to get free samples and like free candy. Mm -hmm. And we were offering we had free things and candy, but we had real intense, real conversations. And um, the young person said to their dad, um, it's it's me or him. You're going to talk to me or him and was trying to pull him away. And, and the dad said, I am going to listen to him. I am going to stay and listen to Abel. And the young person left and went to ride up the escalator and flipped us all the bird as they were going up the, the escalator. Um, these are intense situations for some people, but that dad wanted to hear from a young person who had detransitioned. What do these providers do when facing detransitioners? Um, there were some, there was some things that I would say borderline on inappropriate, abusive things towards some of the detransitioners. They there were some mean statements towards them. There were some statements saying to them, uh, you should not be here. You should not be parading yourself around. You should not be in this space like you. Um, if there was a people... drag show or a child drag show, what would be their reactions? If there were <laughs> trans kids, so-called, parading themselves around, would they have the same? I you ask an excellent question. Um, there was a provider who um, said, well, this is not the booth for me, as soon as they went to speak and went to walk away. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of powerful, there is a lot of power in hearing directly from someone who has experienced medical harm. And I do recognize that oftentimes it, people that experience medical harm are hidden and are not, mm -hmm. I mean, they don't go back to the provider. They, it's like a shameful secret and, and it's people would prefer that they just went away, but these young people are not just going to go away. Well, I'm going to let you run the show. I need to close the door to the laundry room real quick. Okay. I'm still listening. I'll be right back. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Um, that sounds really intense. How many, so you've been on the road a lot. Like we just saw each other in New York. Yeah. Um, how many things like this have you been to? And are you noticing kind of any shifts over time in terms of openness, hostility, whether people are willing to talk? You know, it depends so much on the circles, doesn't it? Um, mm -hmm. I will say that I feel like I'm getting 
more confident myself. And I think that shifts things. So Mm -hmm. I don't know that I was as good at just telling my story to another real person in front of me who doesn't want to hear it and and wants to I think I'm getting every every conversation like that I I look at it as practice it's just really yeah. good practice and also I really do want to engage individuals um some of the people that were the most upset and that we had the toughest conversations at the AAP um the thing that I keep reminding myself and I did try to say to a couple of the other people there was that four, five years ago, that would have been me. I would have been the pink haired rainbow lanyard pronouns coming up to the table, ready for a fight. And so, because I can offer myself that grace, I, Mm -hmm. I can, I have the ability to offer that same grace to those people. And, and I don't see this as a us against them or uh, you're on the wrong, like, uh, I honestly don't see this as political. I don't see this as mm-hmm. my tribe versus yours. I, I, to me, it's just, it's about the science, the evidence and the the quality of the care. And mm-hmm. I had an amazing conversation with a, um, a a woman who was not able to really engage in a productive manner with a number of the other people at our table. And, and part of what we started getting good at is, you know, some of these need to be one-on-one conversations. They don't need to be, mm-hmm. you were, I, I think about things like body language. We're all behind the table, behind all, and mm-hmm. we're all in a line against you, one person. You know, so we walked off to the side, and and really at the by the end, um, she shook. She was willing to shake my hand at the end, um, okay. and and to me, even if we walk away and we absolutely know that there are core elements that we do not agree on, um, the ability to have the tough dialogue in a medical scientific mindset is really all I think we can ask of people. Yeah, that was what I really wanted to ask you about was that you might have, you were describing those three reactions that people had coming up to the table. And it's, you just kind of alluded to it, but it's like, I could see you have having been in each of those three camps, maybe over time, and that that would give you like, a lot of empathy and ability to connect from like you said, maybe I would have come to the table and been spoiling for a fight. And then you were talking about other people coming up and being so relieved to see yeah. that particular silence being broken. Yeah. That empathetic muscle though is, well, it is exhausting to use it over. Like it is, it's a hard, um, it's a hard thing to do. And I, I recognize that all of us were, drained by mm-hmm. day three um but it it was on that last day that i had one of those most difficult conversations and the thing that we uh, i it's interesting because one of the things that for so many medical providers they can almost agree on is that there is bad care there are mm-hmm. it's not just in this realm the yeah. doctor there there are whole areas where bad care and medicine is offered. And her example, which I totally just just ignore the tangent and and <laughs> ignore the substance for a minute because her whole example was on um chronic Lyme. So mm-hmm. whatever you personally believe about chronic Lyme, I don't even want to go there. Her concept is just that Lyme disease or chronic lying like the no, Dr. Chronic- House episode chronic Lyme disease. Okay. Okay. So her perspective is that chronic Lyme disease, there's not real any evidential basis Mm -hmm. for the treatment of chronic Lyme. And that there are physicians who set up shop, oftentimes outside of mainstream hospital systems, and they provide treatments that some would say are harmful. And that Mm -hmm. are, are treatments that are unnecessary and harmful. And her argument was, you know, we could go and create state laws that outlaw 
the treatments of chronic Lyme. And that there would be people who would then just go to the other state to go seek their treatments. Mm -hmm. And she also said that there, as a provider herself, if she had somebody come to her seeking treatment for chronic Lyme and she would say no, which she does, they would just go to a different provider and get the treatment. Mm -hmm. And so what we were trying to discuss, my, my questions back to her was, her argument is that should nobody should make chronic Lyme treatment illegal, but we should do research and provide the evidence and get to the point where there is a high quality standard of care where that's kind of basically just ignored and the few mm -hmm. people that do it are kind of over there. And and some and I and it was a great conversation because some of my questions though to her was does the treatment of chronic Lyme potentially permanently sterilize children i mean the, these are the things that become the heavy part like sure okay. yeah. I, yeah you know what i mean like though that's where that's where these lines become fuzzier to me because you're she's absolutely right the the concept makes sense you you build the evidence around it you make the case that you know we get it out of the mainstream hospitals you know we get it to the point where most parents would not put their kid on a puberty blocker right but then is there still, are there ever any treatments that you can't treat in that way? You can't just kind of, you can't just kind of hide off on the fringes of medicine. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think, those are the questions where I think the ethicists and the the big minds need to weigh in. Because I don't think that the long-term treatment for chronic Lyme sterilizes kids or Right. removes the ability for sexual function or grows body parts that shouldn't be there or potentially removes healthy body. Yeah. So yeah. that's where our line. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a really interesting comparison because yeah, you can totally see some of the same dynamics of like a certain area of care getting spun off and let's say maybe some quacks moving into it and patients doctor shopping and because they feel you know, not believed because they feel like their experiences aren't taken seriously. Like this is definitely something that would be relatable for a lot of people seeking transition. Like a lot of those dynamics are in common, but it's just, it's also totally different. Like, of course, the sterilizing kids. Yeah, that's a really big difference. Another one is, this is something that, you know, we're teaching it to kids in school. The president is making statements about it. It's like the next big human rights campaign. It's being constantly like, promoted and there is a like there are no shortage of people who will question the kind of whatever is going on with like the chronic Lyme treatments and that the doctors who provide them are pretty well marginalized within the field and that's just yeah. not the dynamic here at all right right but i yeah. guess i guess she was basically saying if the evidence for the treatment is that poor then that's the way the system will eventually treat the poor it'll eventually it'll eventually just kind of scurried off to the sides how long um, is eventually <laughs> i don't but see those are the th I, the th there was this undercurrent which i think you see in medicine that there are physicians that do not believe that legislatures or laws should apply to them that they mm -hmm. should at the end of the day get to make these decisions and that it should be I, I think that a lot of doctors don't like the idea of being having laws about their practices yeah. Yeah. We that's our system in the US though. We're a let I mean, we go to court and we yeah. fight laws and we sue people. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we're known for. That I mean, so that's the way we tweak and change medicine. Mm -hmm. Which we know is so different from European countries, but that's I I don't know. We shook hands yeah. at the end, but at the end of the time, at, at the end of it, there was kind of a, what do you do then? Yeah. Well, what do you do? You, I, I guess you show up, um, you, you, you speak with individuals, but also to go back to the original conversation, you have to kind of, there's this medical establishment um, with these three pillars, at least on the provider side. And then there's also a bunch of machinery with the laws, liability, mm -hmm. and then also insurance companies. That's another vector. 
of mm -hmm. uh, pressure or reform, let's just say. So if you're just focusing on the uh, AAP, how do you get the that mechanism, that bureaucracy to admit uh, to reform or to be open to reform? And did you see any movement on that level? I mean, we're not talking about accountability. That's even no, that is too I mean, strong of a no, word, but we're just system, talking about reform. No, systems wise, as a system, the yep. AAPs from a top down, there was multiple presentations regarding gender identity that everything was LGBTQ. It was all tied together. There was no, mm -hmm. um, somebody asked, was there a single presentation that actually just looked at sexual orientation as a different thing from gender identity? No, not at all. Interesting. Um, in the registration hall, when you go to register, um, you get your name tag and then you uh, can go past the wall where you put ribbons you stick ribbons at the bottom of your name tag and the ribbons are like are you an actual aap paid member how you know have you been coming to this conference for 10 20 30 40 years and then the inevitable pronoun wall ribbons are there yeah and there Fair were Fair was top of her fair class in medical school i, I, I mean there <laughs> yeah there was no other that's the thing. There was really no other. There's no other personal identifier wall. There's no mm -hmm. other ribbon. There's no like, I'm a first generation college student who became a doctor ribbon. Um, I'm a I'm in I'm a native Spanish speaker doctor ribbon. There was no. Um, I mean, I could think of so many yeah. other identifiers that are almost more relevant I, I don't but no it was do you have she her her pronouns they them pronouns he him his pronouns a blank pronoun thing and one of the consistent things we started seeing on those who were approaching the booth was they had chosen to put a pronoun ribbon on their badge okay. so I, I and then i think you're gonna see um from you know, from the LGBT Courage Coalition, or Lisa Sellen Davis was there, or even from FAIR, um, you know, I think there were a number of individuals who directly came up to us wanting to leak um, slide decks, recordings. And what was really interesting is these are individuals that we've never actually even interacted with at all before. There was a, mm -hmm. there was a gay man who works in a some sort of pharmaceutical company who is in a couple of these sessions and he came down kind of enraged because he felt like one of the sessions was directly basically stating that feminine boys who grow up to be gay men should be erased i mean that's what he felt like what he got out of the session and he had broken the aap's rules and recorded it oh, as wow. a as a gay man who, as soon as I think it started, he was like, oh no, and just started recording. Um, so I think over the next couple of days, you'll, we'll be seeing more of those slide decks come out and, mm -hmm. and still see that the top down is still very much. Yeah. Um, I, I got my hands transition. on some audio uh, about an hour of presentations and, um, I guess it's fair to say, I think it's okay for me to say that I was at a conference with you two just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it was Society of Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, and the presentations were very, almost dry, and going through and listening to them again, like I start to get the data, but the just the, the modality and the attitude of the speakers towards the what they're speaking about, though there was a little bit of people expressing their opinions and what needs to happen. Everybody was so mm -hmm. clinging to the evidence and, and really aimed towards this. You could just tell in the attitude, this objective kind of hard line um, approach to what we were talking about. And then 
I was listening to this AAP meeting and was all gender woo. And you could tell the attitude towards the data was they were using sociological data. They were talking about how, you know, gender's changing over time and people identify differently more and more and more and more youth are identifying more and more into these gender or non-binary categories as if that proves anything because the kids are being taught to identify into this thing. And so we're, we're identifying the kids into this thing that they're identifying with. And so of mm-hmm. course, well, where does this lead to medicine? How does this, how does this slowly leak into medicine? And you can see just the, uh, uh, the, and Eliza, our first conversation, you talked about this with WPATH. It's like, these people yeah. are in a bubble and they can't let that bubble be popped because if they let the bubble be popped, it's not, it, it, the outcomes of what they're doing to human flesh, to human lives, to family relationships, in on a lot of different measures are harmful. And it doesn't yeah. seem that they can approach the harm yet. It doesn't seem, it seems like if they approach the evidence, then they have to deal with some form of harm. And so so-called parading detransitioners, which isn't a parade in the same way that they are parading the trans kid, which is a literal parade, but the detransitioner is just showing up and being present is one of, it's one of the most important ways to um, encourage people to deal with the reality and to kind of step out of this cultural ideological bubble that it's it's woo woo. It really is woo woo. You could tell by the way that they talk and think. Uh, yeah, is that too they, hard, Jamie? Well, no. I mean, the the gender unicorn was presented at the AAP conference on a slide. I mean, when, that's not that's not scientific, evidentiary like high level data. Um, I will. This is not to. This is not a criticism of. Um, anyone there or anyone that works with me. But one of the things I think we should do is get a little bit better at creating systems of support for when we are directly working with detransitioners. So Mm -hmm. if we have the opportunity to do this again next year, we need to break into shifts like we all worked the booth the whole time we need to we need to set up a schedule with shifts and each shift needs to be um if one of the individuals who have detransitioned is there we also need to make sure we are creating who is the go-to support network for that shift um because I want to honor that they are adults now and have the right to make their own determinations on where they want to be in the world and who they want to speak to in the world. And I honor that and I am willing and want to support them in that in any way that I can. But as the other individuals who did not experience medical trauma around them, we need to also look to what are good trauma-informed mechanisms to support those who have experienced Mm -hmm. medical trauma. So that is making sure that we build in breaks, that we build in support networks, that we make sure if we're going to be at a conference and they are there, then we have indicated what at least relatively trained adult is there indicated for that period to be the support system. It's interesting because that is a role that I can play and I feel comfortable in doing. I know how to de-escalate situations. I've worked with young people who are mentally ill and have suicidal ideas. I mean, I know how to function in the world in that space, in that role. But I need to know, am I in that role at this moment? Am I in Mm -hmm. that role working the table? Um, And I think that as we get bigger as, I don't Hmm know if we're using the word movement but as we get bigger as a movement i think we should start asking some of the questions about are we making sure that they're also financially taken care of so Mm -hmm. it is hard for me to recognize that they are doing so much and we should be finding out financial support mechanisms to make sure that 
they should not be traveling on their own dime at all. They should yeah. not be worrying about you well, know, paying the, for the, the problem Uber with that is the, that as soon as they are funded or supported in that grifters, way, then, right? then they're grifters and they're getting right. dark right wing money and, right. and you know. Okay, but but any so then we have so then we have to make that determination. Is this a movement? Is this an activist movement? If it is, then activists should get paid for their work, especially when they are working in a realm where they are experts. They are content mm -hmm. experts, and content experts deserve to be financially compensated for their work. And I and I did actually hear so in a huge exhibit hall, everybody's giving out samples and. They were joking. They were picking up. They were picking up lotion samples, and they were joking to one another. Am I a grifter right now because I'm getting a free <laughs> sample of lotion? And that to me is just. I, I I appreciate that they can look at it with a humorous tone, but that really incenses me that there are people out there that would even throw that term in their face. They are. Yeah. They have experienced medical harm and damn it, they should already have gotten payouts from these hospitals. They should have already been compensated for their medical harm. Like, yeah, that hmm. just that just strikes me. It's just another level of harm to them to to say that they should not be taken care of for their work. It is. And it's like if you're a public detransitioner, it's basically like you're agreeing to put yourself in the stock and people can throw things at you who are uncomfortable with what you have to say about what you've been through. And that's just so hard. I've never visualized it like that, Eliza. Hmm. That's, that's how it seems to me. Or they're there at AAP and it's like, I, it sounds like they're being treated like they're haunting the place, which in a way they are. Hmm. It's the thing that clinicians don't want to think about. The gender crashers. Right. It's like, but I also see that this, there are elements of this that are healing for them. Yes. We don't tell any other victims. We don't tell rape survivors or survivors of sexual assault or all of these other kinds of harms. We tell them the exact opposite. We tell them, if you want to tell your story, telling your story and the ability to, to, take it off your shoulders and and be heard is for some people a really yeah. huge part of their healing yeah and so i honor that i don't think that's true for every detransitioner but i do think there are elements of for some of these individuals that there is there is a healing process in getting to tell your story and be heard and yeah and to process it and they are processing it and they are also processing it as a group. In some ways they are completing group therapy. They were completing yeah. group therapy in that setting together. They support one another. They clearly care for one another and they have built, are tr they are trying to build these, these systems around each other to, to do the work that the adults that harm them should have are yeah. like, I, I really hope that that 10 years from now, we have true systems in place that they immediately have a place to land with support, with therapeutic supports, with group counseling, with medical transition mm. guidelines, with ICD-10 codes, like all of the things that these people in the forefront are telling us that they need. I really hope that they are forcing that door open and once it's open, the people that come behind them will have those things in place, but I am not going to, I'm not going to take away that they're right as an adult to process their trauma the way that they no, see. No, no. And it's obvious that they feel so much more responsibility toward other young people that they see to be like them than the medical professionals who had that responsibility and don't want to see them at the AAP. Just, uh, just for technical reference what's an icd-10 code just for yeah so in it's a really uh scintillating read yeah <laughs> you see the whole thing it's like it's a phone book <laughs> it's a health insurance code okay. but if you don't have a code you cannot bill and if you cannot bill you yeah. cannot get a provider to treat you 
This is this is a conversation I'd like to poke into, poke our head into, because we had a conversation about this. Because, um, in in effect, some of the gender transition is happening under like mismanaged codes or code switching, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. a it's an entire business in the medical uh, profession. And that Jamie, that that you know of, I, I'd like to hear of uh, about that. And the audience, I think, would learn a lot about how this stuff operates and how it's coded, and and how how those codes are are, I guess, bent and and broken in order to achieve certain ends. Yeah, absolutely. So, so an ICD-10 code is an international code that we are not really fully rolled out within the United States at this point. So the codes that we use within the United States, um, the code that most of the patients that were seen in my clinic fell under was, we refer to it as an F64 code. It basically is anything gender, uh, the old school transsexual code, like the language was still built in there for individuals. When we were, when we were talking about individuals who are medically transitioning as transsexual, that was the code. Um, people who meet criteria for gender dysphoria, this is the code. It's the code that builds the insurance so they know what they're covering, what they're paying for. So one of the things that I heard conversations in my center was that some health insurance companies or or plans do not cover trans-related care in the United States. You can still have an exclusion. You can exclude trans-related care. Um, in the city that I work in, there's tons of Catholic hospitals and there's tons of Catholic schools and you can have your health insurance plan from your workplace and you can have a built-in mm -hmm. exclusion. So nothing F64 gets covered in your health insurance plan. So sometimes parents would bring their kids to us and they would have an exclusion. We would run an F64 code, which is the proper code. It actually talked about what we were doing. And they would call us and say, my insurance company is not covering this. Will you change the code? And then we changed the code. And you could put other endocrine disorder non-specified. You could change the code to general health maintenance. Mm -hmm. You can, people, manipulate codes it's it's quite common but yeah, for it's all this, the time yeah yeah but in this specific case we were intentionally manipulating codes to get coverage and we were doing some of that with state funded and federal funded programs too so things like medicaid medicare chip those kind of programs so what the detransitioners are finding is that they are faced with almost a, a, a an, their own ethical question they don't want to be seen as trans identified within the health mm -hmm. system anymore they want their chart to recognize that they are not trans they are not seeking trans care and uh, one of the detransitioners mentioned that in their health chart they're still they will never be counted within the system as it is as a detransitioner because they are still operating coding underneath being trans and if somebody just pulled raw data they would never you can't say there's one yeah. percent detransitioners if there's literally no coded system to even count them okay so this person is saying i am not trans identified i am a mm -hmm. woman who needs health care because of a medical arm that was done to me and there's no capture system to do that and one of the things that challenges me about my own political party if we're talking about laws and the democrats is that there were a number of states this year that tried to say that health insurance companies need to cover detransition care if you're going to cover a mastectomy and having someone's breast removed and that was the wrong decision and they would like surgical treatment it should be covered to give them back 
they're not going to be functioning, but give them back chest tissue so that they can be read and viewed by society as a female bodied person. Um, Democrats voted against those things. Mm-hmm. And that that is hard to stomach. So that let, let's pause on that. Why would a political party not want to help, let's say, a 22 year old whose breast has been removed and there was a botch, uh, either a botched uh removal or uh she is seeking reconstructive surgery why why would why wouldn't they just give care to that i mean you're putting an acknowledgement of harm on the record you're acknowledging that they exist there was a there was a there was a young person with they them pronouns who came up to our booth and they said wait so you're pro detransition And I'm sitting there next to for for and I thought and I I could not figure out how do you answer that? No, mm-hmm. I'm not pro this. This should never have happened. It's like, mm-hmm. what? Like, how do you be help me out here? What do you say to that? So yeah, I, what what is the implication of that question? What is this person saying that you're pro detransition? So what 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 is their they's point of view on transition and detransition. Eliza, you want to take a pot shot at that? Like what, what is the, I mean, these are the people that you've studied on Reddit. These are the. Yeah. I mean, there's so much dis- discomfort with detransition and people who detransition are often seen within these communities as being like traitors to the cause. And I think that that's what is going on here. And that that's probably what Jamie saw with the, they, them person who comes up is like, <laughs> Are you part of this movement that's weaponizing detransition against the trans community? Like that's probably the way that they think about it. Weapon, they're humans that exist they're that humans, are right they're there. They're humans that, that exist that are right there. But I thought they're and, really and inconvenient. They might. This is where this is where I get so frustrated though because if you're gonna be pro this whole concept of an identity it's like even going against your own beliefs of an identity movement if yeah. your identity movement is you can self-identify into all of these things then you're all but then i don't know it's very authoritarian but you cannot self-identify as detransition like what mm-hmm. like but then i mean it's just part of like certain distinctions are not allowed to be made like okay you can identify it as anything you want but if you don't want to identify as a cisgender woman and you just want to identify as a woman that's not okay either like trans women are certain... women but women are cis women right i mean it's just another distinction that's like not allowed to be made or you're only allowed to do it in a certain direction to a certain end i, I didn't i didn't know what to answer that person and they didn't stick around long Okay. But I was going to ask if there that, was any conversation, but yeah. no, they didn't, they didn't stick around. That shows so something. I mean, that shows a uh, courage or a compulsion inside of that person to some part of themselves wants to see the outcome of the decisions yeah. that they're contemplating. But, yeah. I mean, yes and no. Like on the online trans communities, people will often talk about visiting like the RD trans, the detransition subreddit. And they'll talk about it as this form of self-harm, digital self-harm, that they need help to, to stop. To visit the website? To, to look, visit to read trans, the stories. To read the stories of people who detransition. They will talk about it as a form of digital self-harm. But it's an interesting impulse that, you know, people who hear this, you know, detransition either demonized or increasingly just like minimized and it's no big deal and it doesn't matter as it becomes more visible, that's that's kind of where things to seem to be shifting. There's still this impulse that people feel who are transitioning to be like, okay, but what makes me different from these people, if anything? Did you expand on that? I think, so something that my research has been a lot about is about questions and doubts in online trans communities and how all pervasive they are. And at the same time, how taboo they are and how carefully you have to talk about your questions and your doubts where you can confess the most you know absolutely serious wide-ranging devastating 
doubts about whether you're trans and whether it's a good idea to transition and whether transition is working or whether it's destroying your life. And like these things will come up all the time, but then they'll be packaged with like, but I know that this is just my internalized transphobia and you call on the community and they say, yes, it's just your internalized transphobia. You have to overcome it. So there's this whole way of dealing with questions and doubts, but the questions and doubts don't go away over time. It's very obvious when you see people come back and they say, you know, I transitioned seven years ago. I've been on testosterone. I pass all the time. I've had all these surgeries and I still have doubt every single day. Like I, so I do think that people who are experiencing that, at least some of them are going to seek out other ways of looking at their situation, even if they also then disavow what they find there and go back to the community for more reassurance by saying like I was engaging in digital self-harm by reading these detransition stories, but they really fucked me up. Does that make sense in a kind of a twisted way? Well, then it, the question it, from, uh, from Jamie's point of view or from Jamie's, um, you know, yeah, point of view is like, how does the medical industry adapt to the involvement that it has to this, this, this kind of group think that's happening online. And then the medical industry mm -hmm. is facilitating that, but then not, it needs to catch up at least catch up and say, okay, a certain number or a certain percentage of the people who want to go through this gender care are going to detransition. So we need codes that'll be a subset. Like, how do you start to philosophically, mm -hmm like manage that like th we need a subset of codes that is under the trans umbrella that's called d trans and we just accept them into the fold and we we have to speak about them in the conference too we fold them yeah. into our different presentations on gender I mean, identity i'm not sure about the you know the insurance code piece of it but i think we do see efforts on the part of gender affirming clinicians to kind of make a contained space where the phenomenon of detransition can be managed as it becomes increasingly visible. Um, I think two of the ways that, that that's kind of being managed is talking about, um, okay, maybe three ways. One of them is embodiment goals. One of them is gender incongruence. And one of them is, you know, retransition, detransition. And that basically like, okay, if you're talking about embodiment goals or gender incongruence, um, they're kind of neutral on the question of, you know, where somebody is at in a process of transition or detransition. If I, you know, if I'm a young transmasculine person and I want to get my breasts removed and that's my embodiment goal. And then, and I, and that's my form of like gender incongruence is having breasts that I don't want to have. And then I get treated by a surgeon and they remove my breasts and then down the road, I have regret and I wish that I hadn't done that. And I wish that I had my breast back. Then I have a new embodiment goal and a new form of gender incongruence, which can also be treated in kind of a neutral way. And I think we also see a lot of like clinicians talking about gender journeys, talking about, you know, retransitioning. They're trying to make it, you know, an equivalent between the decision to transition in the first place where the medical system will intervene on a healthy, physically healthy body and, you know, injure and sicken it through hormones and surgeries with the process of like somebody saying, oh, I really regret that. And I think I was harmed. And the gender journeys is just like, yeah, well, it couldn't really be prevented. And so no harm was done. And then you learned about yourself and like, you just kind of went on this, you know, journey of medical self-expression. Hmm. So if you can erase the foul, you don't have to deal with the harm. I think that that's part of it. It's they seem to have shifted into how can we minimize this? Are you, are you seeing online though that individuals who are seeking detransition care they're not if they go back to the center that transitioned them I are are they even getting the care? No, I mean, I think for the most part, the few studies that we have show that they're not going back, right? They're mostly right. not I going mean, back. The but, few detransitioners that contacted us, it was the nurse and I who were, I mean, we were the ones who were building, we should at least have a, you know, like a, this, this is sad. Um, in EPIC, the electronic medical record, you can yeah. build a 
you know, like you're writing in Word and you write the same thing every day and you can build yourself a a code that template. It's, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a template, right? Um we got to the point where we built a template for what to do when a detransitioner calls. Yeah. And we built the template to have the set of questions already prepped and ready. And I still had very little the clinicians, um, clinicians prescribe hormones. And from their mind, if I'm not prescribing this person hormones anymore, why do I need to see them? Mm -hmm. And so, I, and part of the thing that I hear over and over again from individuals who are trying to get off of these treatments, these medications, is they don't, they can't even get guidelines. There's, there's yeah. so much, um, of this concept that, oh, it's so reversible and we didn't do any, it's not serious. You just stop. You just, if you want to be off tea, you just, just stop and then you're done. And I think medically, any endocrinologist or any physician that really thinks about that recognizes that we should have titration guidelines. You should not stop cold turkey. You should be tapered while at the same time getting the mental health care. Mm -hmm. A lot of these patients maybe had PCOS at the beginning, or mm -hmm. they're going to find that when they taper off and stop, their actual bodies, we don't know if their gonads are going to turn back on and start producing their own hormone system. This is yeah. not as simple as, oh, yeah, just stop it. It's fine. Yeah. And I think to that point, I haven't, I'm not sure that I would see it. I haven't seen a lot of evidence of like that clinical preparation to receive people who have kind of gone down this pathway and then wanted to turn back. It seems much more like spin of like, yeah, detransition, like it's just, you know, another body, like it's just not a big deal. It's not serious. It shouldn't be counted against like the kind of gender affirming care that we practice. It's much more that than it is like, I haven't seen evidence of like preparing practical help for people who yeah. go on these illuminating gender journeys. So gender affirming care needs to be modified to affirm the gender of a detransitioner, even though the, even let's just say a detransitioner doesn't want to have a gender anymore. Let's just say that like they don't want mm -hmm. to have a gender anymore. They still need gender affirming care insofar as their gender as let's say a female to male to female, uh, the female, the, the, the second female, needs to be affirmed too. And so just on, on a mental level, the, the, the industries need to think, well, what's the next step? What's the next step? And so there's, but there's a lot of pressure not to develop these protocols because of the ideological capture and because of the pressure that this puts on, I, I guess, like on a political level, but also the, the trans community doesn't want to affirm this or doesn't want this affirmed because that means that there's this doubt aspect to transitioning. Mm -hmm. that, and, and if a trans, let's just say a trans identified female is looking at um, informed consent and there's pictures of detransitioners and this is what happens to your body when you decide not to transition anymore, that, that, is, uh, that triggers some sort of cognitive dissonance and makes them even more unsafe and then they'll petition to not have that information included well pa parents were asking us that though i mean they would ask us things like well nobody ever changes their mind on this right mm -hmm. and and the honest answer should have been well we know that we've already been contacted by x number of individuals who have changed their mind we that would have been real informed consent and given that real information to parents and we should have said and we've been contacted by this number of individuals who believe that they were inappropriately started and should never have been prescribed mm -hmm. and yet they believed in the moment that they desperately should have been prescribed i think parents deserve that information i also think this misses something uh on a wider level that healthcare does not do the best job about talking about, but there are long-term implications for short-term things. So even if you were on testosterone for four years, do we know 
the data that doesn't tell me that 20 years from now you have a higher rate of ovarian cancer. I don't I don't have that data. I don't I, I've seen studies now where individuals who've been on testosterone have actually they've found that there is prostate cells within the vaginal canal. So I in a holistic view of the longitudinal care of the human, I believe that their chart and their medical history, there needs to be indications. I was on testosterone for three years. Therefore, mm -hmm. somebody needs to do the research to say, do I need to be screened for my bone health when I go through menopause? Do I need to be screened for early onset uh dementia? Do I need to be screened for this? Do I need to be looked at as a whole person with a whole um, thing? And that is not happening. And, and that would also have to happen because you acknowledge that the treatment itself has longitudinal implications to the body, the mind, all of those things. But I'll play devil's advocate. On the flip side, I don't want people who are detransitioning to get so wrapped up in almost somatize like their own physical harms. And if there are not, Eliza, do you see where I'm kind of going? That I think sometimes mm -hmm. detransitioners get very much into wanting to be treated more for yes. the harmed treatments that came from it. And they really, these are high engaged individuals with the medical system. They, they use a lot of insurance dollars. They, Mm -hmm. Need a lot of psychiatric, psychological care. Yeah. Yeah. There was a um, a talk at the Sagan, Com Sagan Conference about the, um, the evidence around the use of puberty blockers. And I was listening to it over and over again this week. And it's absolutely scandalous that the answer is we don't have any data on the effect of puberty blockers on children. We don't know. There are questions and we can assume just developmentally that there are certain periods in a human being's life where systems turn on, where my language oh, capacity you're comes the, on. Yeah, the brain, the brain studies. Like the brain studies. So yes. so my, my language goes on here, my spatial ability, my emotional mm -hmm. control, it, it happens at very specific times. And during puberty, a lot of that stuff happens. And if you mm -hmm. shut that system off and turn it back on, that doesn't mean it's going to go back to that same step-by-step -step process. We don't know yeah. the mental implications, like the IQ implications of going on puberty blockers and if you can get off puberty blockers if you go back to you know that rapid development it doesn't seem like it's going to happen you might have know. missed you might have missed the window within that the pubertal staging yeah. for that portion of the brain um mm -hmm. the other thing that gets ignored and is not talked about much is that even people who were given puberty blockers because they were in precocious puberty themselves had harms and reported yeah. those to the FDA and they had long-term implications. Yeah. Tens of and, thousands of. Right. Diverse, I mean, yeah. really that have yes. nothing to do with being trans. So it's not all. even a good Just, treatment when it was. Ah, uh, yeah, good. No, no, no. You're <laughs> okay. good. Okay, so your question has to become, does the benefit outweigh the risk? And so, yes, there is a huge risk if you have a girl going through an adolescent puberty when they're three. <laughs> the, there, there is a risk. Is the benefit of giving it outweigh the risk of those long-term things? So in medicine, we have to ask those questions all the time. Do the benefits outweigh the risks? And I think what some of the research has shown is now you're, you're probably not going to you're not going to treat precocious puberty in a in a nine year old girl anymore. Right. Because the age of puberty is decreased. You're also seeing the age of puberty decrease in different racial and ethnic groups. So black girls start puberty earlier than white girls do in the United States. Um, I think that your benefit still is out still outweighs the risk of somebody's going through puberty at the age of two. 
I, I, I just think your and benefit that outweighs the risk. Like a girl's body can very, trigger. very, 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 very rarely. But if right. it happens, then it, I think your benefit outweighs the risk. But what we did is we took a drug that we knew does have harms. It's this is not we are not giving kids Skittles like these are not mm -hmm. like, even Skittles rot your teeth. But like, you know, we're not giving you. Yeah. And so the and and the so the 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 statement or the the fact of the matter is is that people aren't even asking the harm benefit question when it comes to trans yes. care because they are locked well, into a way of thinking that's gender affirming so the harm is either a uh sterilized uh trans girl or a dead boy kind of thing it, it's not like it, it, would you rather have a a, a dead son or a, or a live daughter becomes would you rather have a dead son or a sterilized and medically altered um daughter right but you can't you can't say yeah. that you can't say that the, the the trans kid can't be actually looked at as a concept that this is a modified human being that is permanently altered in a way that we don't actually understand and that we don't have the long-term studies for or even the long-term care we're inventing this mm -hmm. trans kid there on is, the fly right. there's no there's no good concepts of the long-term care but a trans kid is is, uh, is a medically altered human being it's not it's not like some transcendent category it's a medically altered human being with very crude at this point or at least not well understood interventions in medicine i i understand your term like a medically altered child but okay. there are times in medicine where you have to you do have to make those tough calls if your child is diagnosed with leukemia and they will die in three months okay and you know that the treatment is going to permanently sterilize your child and we're going to do all that we can to potentially see if we can do some sort of fertility preservation but the but the real honest truth is your child will die yeah. if we don't have this and and there are these elements of medicine where these things do exist we do have to medically alter children for the rest of their lives to keep them alive yeah i just don't see that the evidence that we are keeping these kids alive it, re, there's just not the medical evidence to show by transitioning and them and suicide also should never be in the same category of leukemia because we have mm -hmm. the, there are there are there are known ways to keep an individual from committing suicide and i hate yes. talking about you need to put a disclaimer on your podcast that we even brought this up because we talk about this now in this culture in horrid ways we shouldn't even be hmm. but that is what that is what they go to So in, in, in the case of somebody with a disorder of sexual development, well, let's say a, a, a boy whose gonads don't come online, he receives uh, care that would be similar to what a trans-identified female gets. He gets hormone replacement therapy, and he has to weigh and live with the consequences, uh, like the James uh, Linehan that I had on a few weeks ago, wonderful guy. Uh, there's something up with his pituitary gland where it either doesn't produce or doesn't process the the testosterone or the androgens. And so he needs to have androgens every week and he does it himself. Mm -hmm. And, and he describes the process of ha having like high T being 18 year old on, on Sunday and then a, a 50 year old on, on uh, Saturday night mm -hmm. because of the, the spike that he goes through every okay. week. And so mm -hmm. he is going through this. Um, he, he's in the same ca category where he's being medical medically altered or medically cared for and there are other yeah. risks and benefits but it's to treat a very specific condition that it, that is verifiable like you can test it and you can say in his brain he literally has a trans brain in in a, in a certain weirdly messed up way of saying because his brain doesn't act like a man it's somehow trans in a way and so the medical industry is is helping him by giving him this therapy, but that's a different thing than the gender I mean, like trans a, kid. 
underlying it's a medical condition. Thing. It's a different thing, but they also give just, I, I hate to say this, they also just give better care. In a gender center, you come in, you say you're trans, you want a prescription, you don't get your follow-up labs in three months, they're just going to send you a new script if you try to schedule an appointment. We were writing scripts for a solid year. We were just like, oh, here, people people who are in some of these states where care has been cut off, have been on tea, they have stockpiles and stockpiles of stockpiles of tea. They have tea mm-hmm. like coming out of their their you know up to their eyeballs and tea you 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 do much better much better medical monitoring for individuals who have actual endocrine disorders that require external hormones to be given they are doing full profiles of the whole hormonal makeup you get your labs drawn they look at the long-term care they provide you know really full functional wraparound services um it is not it, it is not like somebody at Planned Parenthood giving a 16-year-old a prescription for tea and they won't even draw the lipid panel. Mm-hmm. Because if they draw the lipid panel at Planned Parenthood, they're going to find that the panel is off and they never wrote a treatment protocol to treat it. That's not how we care for any other group of young people. And honestly, one of the things that irritates me to no end is that I get called transphobic and people talk as if I hate trans people. And one of the things that I hate is we just give them really, I'm sorry, really fucking shitty care in this country. We treat them like garbage. We throw these people away. We let them go to Planned Parenthood. We give them no upfront care and we literally give them no back end care. It's like my community is like somebody you can just take money from and shit on. And I think that that is one of the things that disgusts me the most. They're just, using they're using these kids and they're treating them like their long-term health doesn't matter but my people this community matters i want these kids to be alive when they're 80. i don't want them to have these long-term medical arms because we think that they're throwaway people planned parenthood is throwing these kids away you don't think it do they not think it matters that a 16 17 18 year old already has bad cholesterol and and they're not even going to give them cholesterol medication like i'm sorry that just it just makes me sick that 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 is not part of this dialogue so benjamin and i could speculate but how do you understand like this is something that i've tried to understand from the outside is this how do you understand the provision of really substandard care with these patients because there is something that people get right this is a marginalized community people Mm -hmm. that are gender non-conforming that don't look like we fit in society that act weird you know i'm a masculine female i have hairy armpits i'm mean and yell and i'm like you know we we are there are elements that we do have in act like we don't have the the same access and power within these systems and so some of this did come from a good place where some of this started because the idea was we we wanted to like bring people into the fold of accessing medical care but there's mm-hmm. so many other elements that are completely ignored the lgbtqia community however you wanted to find that we have high rates of alcoholism we smoke way more than heteronormative cultures we actually have more domestic violence than hetero people we do have there are pressures that we we have poor medical we have we we access medicine in poor ways anyway i mean i don't want to discount that it does kind of suck if you go to the if i go to the gyn and i'm like no i don't need a pregnancy test and they're like you have to have a pregnancy test and it's like no i you know i'm a lesbian or i identify like this or having you know people in medicine ignore who your partner or spouse might be i do not discount that there are things that needed to be fixed within medicine to care for this community. Giving every gender non-conforming 15-year-old, 15-year-old T was not the fix that we needed. Hmm. And I will step off my soapbox because I know we need to probably wrap up soon. But yes, no. clearly I'm passionate on this issue. No, it's it's super fucked up. And it would be especially hard. I like I know that. I know that people say that you don't care about these kids and it just 
I remember the first time that I read what you wrote on the free press and the first time that I heard you speak about it, I was like, it couldn't be more obvious how much you care about it. Hmm. What next? What, what what's the most pressing matter, uh, Jamie? I mean, what what are some of the ideas you know um, to challenge, to change, to reform those three pillars, or and uh, which are the three societies that are kind of giving out the the roadmap. final question? You're going to throw the hugest one out, and I don't. <laughs> um, listening, changing the dialogue. Um, I think there's so many cultural issues about freedom of speech and and the inability for people to have complex conversations without it turning into just a yelling fit on you voted for who did you vote for and yeah. Um I think next is I think I we're going to Denver. Jen Speck is meeting in the United States. Um Debbie path is going to be there. And I do think we're probably on the precipice of building new models and new movements. So I'm trying to build hmm. an alternative to glad HRC, yeah. the human, you know, I'm yeah. trying to yeah. build communities for yeah. the LGBT to, to have our voices heard and to affect change in, in, in positive ways. There, there's a, there are different um, organizations forming, associations that are forming. There's a lot of overlap, but they all have different. Um, and th there's somewhat, there's some friction too. There's a, it's kind of interesting because there's a bunch of humans, you know, trying to trying to get a lot of stuff done in a little bit of time. But there's different uh, that ways happens. that it's being approached in different manners. Like there's, uh, there does need to be a conversation. Uh, that centers detransitioners that 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 allows parents uh you know to to have forums mm -hmm. there's conversations within the medical field and then uh kind of there's cultural conversations too there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of different tonality some some conferences or some groups are more um, focused on the cultural matter some are more focused on the medical matter and there's no reason i don't think there's any reason that they can't exist side by side um in parallel and jamie you're kind of in between in your own way you're, you're showing up to all these different things and you're you're bringing your expertise so you're bringing your politics you're bringing your your lived experience to these different places and then but what i see the through line is is that you're, you're acting as a care provider the whole thing is is because you're a care provider and you're motivated by by care uh you're, you're like uh, the old school doctor uh medicine woman what's her name dr quinn medicine woman you're like oh, yeah. you're out on the plane you're handing out the herbs eliza you're too young for to this get, show yeah. Yeah, dr what? quinn medicine woman you don't yeah. remember that show god that's yeah. beautiful ben thank yeah. you for that I'm so, gonna. I'm gonna actually. It's totally lost on me, but I'll. I'll okay. I'm gonna hold that later. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna hold that. Yeah. So, um, so I guess in or to wrap up to close off, um, what are some of the associations that that you uh, want to put forward? Uh, both of you want to put forward, or or the works, the writers, the the uh, mm -hmm. associations, the resources. Eliza, I think you can. I'll list my own, and then you can list all of the ones that were. Okay. Too. So um, I'm working with the LGBT Courage Coalition. Um, you can find us on Substack. You can find us on Twitter. We are really working right now to um, challenge the concept that the LGBT is a monolith that all believes that medicalizing mm -hmm. children is the right path. We do not believe that. We recognize that there are harms and we want to see that changed. And we also want to see the dialogue within the LGBT change to recognize that free speech needs to be part of our everyday experience and we cannot continue to shut down dialogue even when it's hard and challenging. It's the job of adults to have these difficult conversations. Yeah. And you guys are just putting out great writing and thinking all the time. So it's really, I'm not your target audience, but I really appreciate Thank you. it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think 
I think beyond that, like a lot of it is what Jamie's talking about, where it's like, okay, we need to bring the grownups back into the room and they need to act like it. Um, so when it comes to a lot of the professional medical societies, like Jamie's talked about, there were a lot of people who I would call like, you know, they're kind of the professional grownups, like they are paid to be the adults in this you know, in US society, in this area of medicine, a lot of them have tried to sit this one out. They have avoided information that would make their jobs hard. They have outsourced very controversial and very consequential decisions to pretty junior ideologically captured staff. That's something that we see with the American Academy of Pediatrics and like Jason Rafferty, who, who Jamie was talking about, like who wrote their policy statement in 2018. and. And who had, I think, maybe an interesting week last week because he's being sued by a detransitioner. Um, so, yeah, encourage the grown-ups to be grown-ups, to pay attention, to do their job, which is to create a space for sane dialogue, to bring the evidence back in, to take the temperature way down. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, you know, Jamie is talking about the three organizations that are, you know, the three-legged stool that's supporting this in the U.S. And I think globally, it's like there are these two pillars and we need to take them both down. And one of them is the idea that there is a right group of children to do these kinds of procedures too. And the other one is that there's a right way to do it. And I don't think that either of those are true. And I think anything that we can do to challenge the assumptions that have gone into that about the right and wrong, wrong way to be a boy and a girl and the assumptions about the human body that have not taken it seriously as a very complicated, very complex organism that we don't understand well and that haven't taken adolescent development and windows of opportunity and just like human growth and change over time seriously. We need to bring that back too. Well, it's a pleasure to, um, and an honor to, uh, be alongside you and, and to watch, um, both of your work unfold. So thank you very yeah, much. And seriously, for... Jamie, I'm so grateful that you're here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was just, when you came out, it was a really big deal. I know you know that, but. Thanks. And I think if we do this again, are, we should do it at like pretty great too i just have to say like you're all like yeah so if we do this again we should do it at five o'clock with like cocktails or <laughs> all right gin and tonic with, with a twist of lime yeah okay next time all right okay thank you both very yes much. thank right. you okay bye bye cool thank you both you guys have a good day um